Welcome to a new episode of the podcast. Vox Agent is made by AI for business executives that work with AI. So if you're relying on large language models for anything mission critical, you know, reading a whole code base, sifting through hundreds of legal documents, you've hit the wall. We all have. Oh, absolutely. It's that context window. It's the uh, the fundamental bottleneck. The attention span of our most powerful tool. Yeah. And we keep trying to solve it with brute force. Exactly. Just bigger models, bigger windows. But the source material for today's deep dive makes it incredibly clear that that path is, well, it's not just unsustainable, it's financially ruinous. And, you know, it doesn't even fix the core problem. Okay. So let's unpack this. We're going to get into something the research calls recursive language models, or RLMs. And this sounds like a totally different way of thinking. It is. Our mission for you today is to really get under the hood of this mechanism that lets an LLM process information that's like two orders of magnitude bigger than its own context window. Two orders of magnitude. And we need to understand why this smarter strategy just completely beats the, you know, the expensive brute force method of just making the window bigger. All right, let's start with the crisis itself. We all know LLMs have memory limits, but why is just expanding that window, say, from 100,000 tokens to a million, why is that a failure waiting to happen? It fails for a, a really nasty combination of reasons, performance and cost. On the performance side, you have this thing called context rot. Context rot. I think I've felt that. We all have. Even the absolute best models, your GPT-5s, they suffer from it. The model's performance just degrades really fast as the prompt gets longer. Right, that's when you realize it completely forgot a critical detail you put in, you know, 20 pages ago. Exactly. And the sources prove this gets worse with complexity. I mean, look at the benchmarks. The models do okay on a simple needle in a haystack task. Just find this one fact in a giant document. Precisely. Simple retrieval. But then you give it a complex reasoning task, like oolong pairs, where it has to hold multiple facts in its head and cross-reference them. And performance just falls off a cliff. And then there's the cost. Yeah. What is the um, the technical term, the quadratic complexity of the attention mechanism? What does that mean for the bottom line? Well, it means that if you double the input length, you don't double the cost. You quadruple it or worse. Oh, wow. So trying to process a multi-million token document in one go, it just becomes economically impossible. A query goes from pennies to dollars and your whole business case is just gone. So brute force is out. Yeah. What about the workarounds we use now, like summarization? They're lossy. That's the problem. Summarization assumes you can safely forget details. For a lawyer analyzing a contract, that's not an option. You can't summarize away the fine print. And what about something more advanced, like retrieval agents or yeah. RRAG? RRAG is great for finding the right paragraphs, but it struggles with deep synthesis. It retrieves chunks of text, but it can't really do that multi-hop reasoning, piecing together clues from five different places to form a new conclusion. It finds, but it doesn't orchestrate. Which brings us to the RLM. This is the big idea. Yeah. So what's the fundamental shift here? The aha moment is this. Stop trying to jam the giant prompt into the model's brain. Instead, you treat the prompt as part of the external environment. An environment. So the data isn't just something to read, it's something to interact with. Exactly. And the way it does that is through a programming interface. Internally, the RLM starts up what's called a read evil print loop, the REPL. Or APL. Okay, for those of us who aren't coders, yeah. what's a simple way to think about that? Think of it as a live interactive command prompt inside the model's head. It can write a little piece of code, run it, see what happens, and then decide its next move. I like that. A live command pump. So how does that work with the huge document? The entire 10 million token document is just loaded into that environment as a variable. Let's call it context. So the LLM is no longer a passive reader. It's an agent that writes code to manage this context variable. How does that help it get past the memory limit? It writes code to do three things. First, it can peek into the data you know, just look at small parts of it. Second, it can programmatically construct subtasks based on what it sees. And third, this is the recursive part, it can invoke itself on a tiny relevant snippet of the text. So it's its own manager, it's a decomposer, breaking the big problem down, and then a synthesizer putting the answers back together. That's it. It's way smarter than RRAB because the AI agent dynamically figures out the best way to break down the input. It's not a pre-programmed strategy, it's an emergent one. And the sources showed it using actual coding tools, right? Like mm -hmm. search functions. 
yes, this emergent behavior is amazing. Yeah. The RLMs learn to use things like rejects queries to find specific keywords. So if it's looking for festival and La Union in 10 million tokens, it doesn't read everything. It writes a bit of code, narrows the search space down to a few thousand tokens, then it makes a recursive call to its LLM brain. Super targeted. Incredibly efficient. Okay, let's talk results. This sounds great in theory, but for the executives listening, does it actually work at scale? Oh, it works. The validation is, it's just resounding. RLMs were successfully handling inputs in the 10 million token range. That's just orders of magnitude beyond what a standard model can do in one go. And that oolong pairs task, the really complex one where the base models just fell apart. This is the most stunning finding. On that task, the base model's GBT5 included failed catastrophically. We're talking F1 scores of less than 0.1%. So, basically useless. They return to garbage. Complete garbage. Now, you take that exact same GBT5 model, but you wrap it in this RLM environment, and it achieves an F1 score of 58.00%. Oh, from 0 to 58%. It proves that it's the orchestration layer, not just the raw size of the model, that unlocks this complex reasoning. Okay, but then the next question is always cost. Is all this orchestration expensive? That's the other amazing part. On the BrowseCom Plus task, that's a thousand documents, up to 11 million tokens, the RLM with GPT-5 got 91% performance, the average cost, 99 cents. And how's that compared to the old lossy methods? Well, a standard summarization agent got about 70% performance for 57 cents. So for 42 cents more, you get a 20 percentage point jump in quality. It goes from being unreliable to mission critical. Wait, hang on. If the RLM is making all these extra calls to itself, how is the cost even comparable? Shouldn't be way more expensive? It's because of that selective viewing we talked about. Mm -hmm. It's not processing 11 million tokens. It's using code to narrow its focus to maybe a few thousand tokens before it has to think. So it only pays for the context it actually needs to see. In some cases, it was up to three times cheaper than the summarization baseline. Better performance, huge scalability, and comparable or even cheaper median costs. That's, that's yeah, that's a triple threat. And it holds up. As the prompts get longer and more complex, the RLM's performance barely drops while the base model just falls apart. Okay, so let's shift to strategy. If this context wall really is coming down, what kind of new applications does this unlock for a business? Well, think about autonomous software engineering. An RLM agent can now navigate and safely modify a massive code base, maybe 900,000 tokens. No single model could ever hold that entire structure in its head before. And for industries like legal and compliance, you could do a truly exhaustive analysis of discovery documents. Mm -hmm. No more summaries, no more truncation. Right. And in scientific research, it's a shift from just reviewing literature to synthesizing new insights from vast libraries of published papers. It could really accelerate discovery. But with this new power, there must be new risks. What are the trade-offs? The sources mentioned high cost variants, for instance. That's the big operational reality. The median cost is low, but the system is iterative. It keeps trying things until it finds an answer. So for a really hard problem, you could see a long RLM trajectory. So wait, the median cost is a dollar. But for my most critical complex query, could it suddenly spike to five or ten dollars? That makes budgeting tricky. That's the challenge, exactly. A complex query could trigger dozens of subcalls and code executions. So you get a higher quality answer, but you also get a higher, less predictable cost on your hardest problems. And the biggest weakness seems to be what the source is called decomposition brittleness. Right. We're basically trading context rot for planning rot. The whole system's effectiveness depends on the base model's ability to come up with a good plan to break the problem down. If that initial plan is bad, the errors just cascade. Can you give an example of a bad plan? Sure. One of the models they tested, Quinn 3 Coder sometimes, over-recursed. It found the right information, but its orchestration logic just failed. It didn't yeah. know when to stop or how to package the final answer correctly. So the quality of the base model as a planner is now almost more important than its raw knowledge. Precisely. And there's also latency. The current system makes one call, waits, makes the next call. It can be slow. Now, the research suggests asynchronous calls could fix this, but it's a factor for now. And it seems like different models have different personalities, I guess. You have to tune the system for each one. That's a great way to put it. The Quen3 coder model was very liberal with its calls. It tried to make a recursive call for every single line of code it saw. They had to actually add a warning in the system prompt telling it to, you know, calm down and not overdo it. So this has been a really fascinating deep dive. Recursive language models. 
a completely different way to bypass those architectural limits by turning the prompt from a static thing to read into a programmable world to explore. And the core takeaway here is strategic. For anyone building AI applications, the goal is shifting. It's not just about buying access to the biggest, most expensive base model anymore. The competitive advantage is moving up a layer to the architecture itself. Exactly. The future competitive edge isn't raw size. It's building the most intelligent orchestration layer. It's about turning that static model into a dynamic, self-steering agent. That's where you'll find the real breakthroughs. Thank you for joining the podcast and see you soon.